Good morning. Welcome to day three of Dreamforce. This session is called Test the Pyramid. My name is Larry Latimer. I'm a software engineer in IT and Salesforce. I'm uh, Josh Boyden. I'm a quality engineer at Salesforce IT. So everybody's seen this a dozen times or more already. It basically says, please make your buying decisions only on the products commercially available from Salesforce, our forward-looking statement. So we'd like you in this session to rediscover the importance of testing. We've gained more and more value in our testing as we've learned to do it better and more often and cover more of our code. So some of the techniques we use that we're going to share with you that we find successful and very powerful are value in class injection for functional tests and Selenium for UI, JavaScript, and end-to-end -end tests. So why test? It is a requirement to deploy. We all know that. We have to hit that 75%. But we also want to hit the spirit of the coverage, not the percentage of the coverage. We also have regression that we want to prevent. So regression testing is very important. We need to know that uh, the code that we deployed six months ago isn't going to become buggy when code from next week is deployed. So we continuously run our tests, our whole test suite before every deploy in our QA environment. So, so why test differently? Some problems that we've bumped into being in Salesforce IT is we've got a giant enterprise architecture and it's extremely complex. Uh, we're working in a shared environment so there's lots of other teams making changes along the way and there's a lot of potential for conflict. So we find that having a regression suite to run and provide confidence and uh, ensure that everything's working as designed before we deploy is, is extremely valuable. So we want to encourage you guys, uh, plan for a larger org. You might have a small uh, system now, but in the future it's going to be a lot more complex. So start thinking about developing your test suites uh, now. So the test pyramid, the concept of the test pyramid comes originally from Mike Cohn and Martin Fowler. I'm sure you all know Martin Fowler. If not, you should definitely be looking into his ideas. Um, so his, this philosophy is to do fewer UI tests and, that are end-to-end -end oriented and more fast-running, fast-result functional tests. Yeah, so uh, I can quickly talk about the, if you want to back up, yeah. Let's quickly talk about the pyramid. So you can see uh, at the very top there, wow, over here. You've got the UI test at the very top. It's a smaller amount. And then in the middle, you've got APIs. And then at the very bottom, you've got a large amount of unit tests. And I put the arrows on there indicating that cost of development goes up as you move up the pyramid, and time to execute goes down as you're moving down the pyramid. So unit tests are cheap and run very quickly. UI tests are more expensive to develop, and they run a lot slower. So testing the pyramid and uh, Salesforce technologies. So kind of applying these to different Salesforce technologies. You've got, uh, if you're testing Visual Force pages or Lightning components or any kind of JavaScript, that's a good candidate for the UI layer there. Uh, API tests, you'd want to do REST calls or any kind of triggers that you have. And then unit tests are the, any kind of classes, class methods, class properties, and trigger helpers that you have. What to test? One of the things as developers that we, for, we don't test often enough is our declarative processes. So we try to hit those validation, validations and workflows and make sure that they are not going to interfere with our code and our test, test methods as well. Positive and negative tests. We want to hit every, every state of that function or that method and make sure that all of our if blocks are hit, all of our exceptions are hit. Um, any, if you get multiple exceptions, make sure you apply code that will test each one of those. And we want to make sure that our, you know, all of our methods and our, all of our properties entering and exiting, we're getting a controlled value, a known value. And then user interface. So Josh in a moment is going to show us some Selenium. But there's other UI testing tools available as well. So this is a quick breakout of the different types of, of tests that we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to be focusing on the very bottom of the pyramid and the very top. So that's unit tests and then UI tests. 
So on the left-hand side there, you've got unit tests, and they're, they're, there's lots of those. They run quickly. They're very focused on a specific piece of code, and they're more method-specific, so you're trying to test individual methods. And then UI tests, you can think of those as uh, you have less of them. They're slower. They're a lot more complex, and uh, they're really business process focused, so kind of doing an end-to-end -end test. So functional tests. Conventionally, we're taught um, in all the documentation, we build our records, we insert our records, we update our records, then we query them back out, and we do our asserts. After all that's done, the database has to be rolled back, and then we start the next test. So each one of those is very expensive, very labor intensive on the, on the org. Also, we're taught to test from the trigger itself all the way to the end of the process. So that takes a lot of time as well. A lot of setup as well, too, if you've got dependent processes and dependent data. So an alternative, which is really important when you're focusing on that bottom of the pyramid, all those functions, is to avoid the DML. So build, plan and build your methods using in-memory parameters. And you can do that using, by injecting your values into classes for testing. Um, also by isolating. So when you inject into your classes, make sure they're either public or at test visible. Isolate your SOQL and DML statements so you don't necessarily have to hit them. Um, you can do that with um, test is running tests, or that's where the mock classes come in. So injecting classes. You can use interfaces for testing, and, you, and they're often referred to as mock classes. Um, so there's other sessions that focus on that, and I would highly recommend hitting those when you get a chance. Um, if you do all this, and you do it successfully, your tests are going to run faster. You're not going to need the DML. You're not going to hit the database. You're not going to interfere with other code. You're, you're going to be less chance of um, hitting your governor limits, is, which is one of our biggest problems in our environment. Um, also, your validations and workflows will never be hit as well, so you're not going to be blocked by those. And, be, and of course, you've already tested them in other areas. So I've got this very well, yeah, I've got a very contrived scenario that I'm going to show you real quick. It's basically a roll-up of contacts. There's three contacts, and it's going to roll up to a contact count. And it is contrived. You can do this in so many other easier ways, but I'm doing it through code. If I delete, delete Jane, my count increments, de decrements. And that's basically what the code's going to do. So to test this now, I've created in my class, because I planned ahead, I have this private property that's at test visible. So I can inject my contacts into that property, and I, never, I don't have to hit the database. So when contacts equals null at line 11, I'm not going and querying the database. So I didn't have to set up my contacts. I didn't, I'm not pulling them back. And to, the way I build my data is I'm using JSON strings. So previously, I've gone into my production environment. I grabbed the SOQL statement that I'm going to use in a production scenario, and I've pulled back the data I need, and I've serialized it into a string. And I either hard-code it in my test itself, or I've used uh, key value pairs in resource files. And this is a simple script. I'll post this in Chatter later. But it's a simple script that I use to go grab my, my SOQL um, result set and um, serialize it. One of the things to notice on line 9 this is something I didn't get for a long time. But the last parameter takes, it has to tell what kind of object it is. So the dot class actually converts that list or describes that list of accounts as a list of accounts. So let me show you a little bit of the code, and then we'll actually run the test. So at line 9, you can see my um, property that I mentioned earlier. And then my first, uh, my first method. This is my entry point from my trigger. It's taking two 
parameters. One's my new list, and one's my old map. And I'm going to loop through this and decide which accounts I have to roll up to and create a list of IDs that I'm then going to go query and get all those contacts. Because I'm not just going to roll up the contacts I'm working on. I'm going to roll up all the contacts for that account. And then when it's done, it's going to return that list of accounts. So when it's done running, I'm going to have a list of accounts without even hitting the database that I can then assert on. So this, this method, so this isn't very atomic, so it was, it's, not really, it's violating my best practices already. But it's calling another, another method to actually do the roll-up. And then after that, it's calling the last method to do the update. This is where I mentioned on line 66 that you can bypass any updates or SQL statements or pretty much anything by using this is running test. It's not necessarily a best practice to put code like this into production. And that's where you could possibly use a mock class to actually mock up your DML class. So I'm going to go ahead and run it real quick. So it runs very quickly because it never hit the database. And I'm covering 93% of my code. So with the remaining bits and pieces, we can get that through end-to-end -end testing or some other um, functional test that actually hits the database. All right. So now we're going to go back to the presentation, and Josh is going to show us some Selenium. Cool. I'm Josh. Uh, talk a little bit about Selenium. So now we're talking about the tip of the pyramid, the very top there, the UI tests. To get started here, um, just I want to see maybe raise of hands. How many people have heard of Selenium? All right, looks like a lot of people. How many have developed with Selenium? All right, less, less of you. OK, cool. That's perfect. So, so I'll go over it real quick, but Selenium automates browsers. That's, that's it. Uh, it's a free, open source, third-party library. It creates browsers, and it simulates user interaction on those browsers. So why use Selenium? Uh, it's a good, uh, we talked about this earlier, but it's a good candidate for Visual Force pages or any kind of uh, complex JavaScript that you have, or complex end-to-end -end workflows. Uh, it's a, it uh, allows you to basically sidestep governor limits, whereas if you were putting something uh, like an end-to-end -end workflow in an Apex unit test, that would run in a single transaction, and you might uh, end up hitting uh, your limits. Uh, but if you're simulating user interaction, you can, you can restart those transactions and, and test the same thing without hitting the, li the limits. So Salesforce IT, we use Selenium. We're the, we work on the checkout team, so we support the e-commerce website. Uh, it's uh, customer facing, and it's uh, UI intensive. It's all custom Visual Force, and uh, we've got a lot of JavaScript on there, a lot of validation rules, and, uh, or input validations, and then uh, DOM manipulations on the pages. So we find that using Selenium is invaluable. We've got... Um, 76 Selenium test cases, and we cover 90% of our use cases. Um, so uh, we, we, uh, we have an extensive use of Selenium test cases. So to, to kind of introduce Selenium, um, I have came up with this sort of fake test case. Um, so the, the scenario is that you've got a UI intensive account edit page, and uh, there's a name field on it, and then there's a phone number on it. And the phone number is auto formatting. So you can see here I've got this little, little GIF running. But basically, it strips out anything that's not a digit before you hit save, so on blur. So the test case is uh, you've been tasked with uh, testing the, the JavaScript on the phone input. So this is a good candidate for Selenium. And uh, I'm going to get into the code of how I tested this using Selenium. So first, I'll show you the code. Um, can you guys all read this? I made it bigger earlier, so I think. Good? Everyone good? All right, cool. So here is the, the first part's doing some setup. So I'm uh, setting some properties. And then um, here's a, this right here is a page object, uh, which remember later I'm going to get back into it. But basically, it's an encapsulation of the home page. So the idea is you've got a single class encapsulating the home page. And it's uh, going to do login with uh, my login URL and my username and password. And then we're going to wait for the page to load. 
And then uh, down here, it's a big stretch where we're uh, loading up the UI intensive account edit page, this account edit page object. And then we're going to get the name input and the phone input. And then here are the test inputs that we're going to be testing. So we're testing with uh, some standard formatting that you would kind of imagine for a phone number and then some crazier stuff down near the bottom. And this is where the, where the test actually gets going. You uh, are sending uh, the keys down to the phone input and then clicking on the name field to blur out the phone and then storing the results right here. And then at the end, we do an assert, make sure that everything is what we would expect. So enough of that. I'll, uh, Give you a quick, I'll give you a quick run through. You can see I've thrown a bunch of sleeps in here to uh, make it run a little slower because this test runs really quick if you don't have any sleeps. It's basically impossible to see. So I'm going to spin up a browser really quick, go to login.salesforce.com, put in my username and password, and then it's, I'm not, sorry, I'm not doing anything, just <laughs> to be clear. And then uh, it's uh, going to go to the home page. And then we'll navigate to the uh, Visual Force page that I wrote, which is the account intensive, or UI intensive account edit page. And then here you'll start seeing that it's going to be inputting those uh, test values that we saw earlier. So it's um, going to put those in and then blur out and make sure that the, the JavaScript clears out the, the format. And then we're storing all those values as we go. And this is doing a really good job of simulating user interactions. So Selenium's written in a way that it actually emulates a, a user on the, on, the, on the page. It's not doing API calls or anything. And then we're done. Now we're on the detail page, and then, and then we're out. And so the test passed. It ran in 50 seconds. Um, usually it runs in 13 or 14 seconds. So getting into some design concepts to kind of get you. So the idea here is I kind of wanted to get you guys interested in Selenium, get you guys knowledgeable. And then here's some design concepts that are good to know as you're starting out. So um, something that I wish I'd known when I started developing with Selenium, but the, the page object model. So I, I mentioned it earlier, but the idea is you encapsulate a page. Each page on your website is an individual Java class, and then the methods in that class act as getters and setters for individual web elements on the page, or they perform perform like very simple basic actions. You don't want like a whole, a really long workflow in inside of a page object, but you can do simple actions. Like I had the do login action, which is basically going to just log into the page. Um, and then the test classes control the logic and uh, set up the test data and do assertions. So here's a diagram of kind of what I just talked you through. So you have on the left-hand side, you've got login.salesforce.com, which is the actual web page. And then in the middle there, you've got the Selenium web driver, which is uh, going to sit in between. And then on the right-hand side, you've got all your custom Java classes. So the, the one there, the page object one, is a Java class that is representing the login.salesforce.com actual page. And it's got a username uh, property and a password property. And you could kind of envision more things on there, like a login button, but I just cut it out for brevity's sake. And then you have a get username and get password. And you'd also have a set on there as well. And then on the far right-hand side, you've got your test class. And that's responsible for doing data and uh, running the logic, so setting the, the, the password and uh, username and then clicking the login button and then doing the assertion to make sure that it, that it worked. Cool. So um, that's really getting started with Selenium. I've got uh, my project source code up there. So everything that I just demoed is all up on GitHub. You can download that. I've got instructions for how to do it. And uh, I've also got the Visual Force page up there, too. So you can put that in a dev org and, and get going right away. We'll post these slides afterwards, too, so you don't have to scramble to get this link, but we'll have it up later. So when you guys are testing, um, plan your testing ahead of time. Uh, write lots of focused Apex functional tests. Make sure that you have your parameters isolated so you're not hitting, you're not hitting the database. You're not hitting other um, dependent objects. Use tools like Selenium to test the UI, JavaScript, and do your end-to-end -end tests as well. Um, and reduce your dependency on the platform. Avoid those DML statements um, and write atomic methods. So if you do all that. Uh, we find that kind of adhering to these principles and, and designing your test suites with the test pyramid in mind is going to really improve the quality of your code and also the produ productivity of your developers. So cool. That's, that's the tail end of it. Now we're going to open up 
for questions. We've got our contact information up there. Um, and again, we'll, we'll post the slides on the chatter group. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions, you can just shout them out, and we'll, we'll repeat them and, and uh, go from there. Anyone? Okay. It, also, you can talk to us after we're done here. Yeah, too. we'll be we'll, we'll hang loitering out around, bit. too, if you, if you want. The, my, the Selenium sample code? Yeah, well, I can make mine available too. Yeah, yeah. So the question was, is the code going to be available? Yeah, we'll we'll post it on the on the chatter of the session group here. We'll post links to it afterwards. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't really cover that. I just mentioned it. But there's there's other sessions. Aldo Fernandez, he has done some great sessions on mocking up classes. It's similar, but it's not built the same. It's not using Salesforce platform functionality. You're, you're rolling it up yourself, and you're doing it yourself and using it. <laughs> I consider it a best practice. I don't know if... <laughs> yes. Um, if you can stay away from those DML statements, that has hit us really, really hard. We're hitting 101 limits all the time. And so we're having to back out a lot of our, our test code and rewrite it. Yeah, I, th I think what we've found uh, kind of being, we've worked together now for two years or whatever. And, and, and what we found is that doing both of them in combination. So um, yeah, Larry, Larry's test code that he demonstrated isn't actually doing any DML. You're not testing any DML, right? But <clears throat> When you run through Selenium, you are doing testing those DMLs because that's a full-on user. Like that's everything. That's doing it all. So, um, doing them in combination is really where you're going to get the value. You can have the unit tests that are going to be running really quickly, and then the UI tests that are going to cover those. Like Larry had 93% code coverage. You can get the rest of those percentages with uh, Selenium end-to-end -end testing. Yeah. So. So the question was uh, kind of our views on how testing fits in with the life cycle of the team, like software development life cycle, how we, how we do it. Yeah, we, um, we um, test alongside of the developers. So we work hand in hand, and we're developing test code as the, as the development's going on. And then um, we're running uh, continuous uh, integration tests. So our tests run every night. And we're looking for failures and uh, populate up the swim lane. So we've got a dev sandbox, a QA sandbox, and then a stage sandbox. And we're promoting code from dev to QA, and then running our tests, and then going to stage before we go to production. And as far as test-driven development, we're really not practicing that right now. We, we see the value. We definitely do. It's a habit that we just have to get into. So a lot of our testing is written after we, the developer has done the methods to, that they're modifying. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, there's a there's a ton of tools. Like there's a bunch of, there's like a bunch of JavaScript frameworks too you can look at. Um, Selenium is definitely the best one. Like it's very well supported. You can use other stuff, but um, I've really only used Selenium. But yeah, you could Google for it pretty quickly and you find a lot of different stuff. Yeah, Phantom JS. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Oh, to run. Yeah, we use uh, Jenkins. So we've got Jenkins kicking off uh, all these test suites. Uh, to do the continuous integration. And we use, we use kind of a Jenkins pipeline, right? So you've got the deployment of the code, and then you run the Apex tests, and then you run the Selenium tests after that. So it's a whole triggered flow that happens every night. All right. Thank you, guys.